If you ask someone about British battlecruisers, HMS Princess Royal tends to fly under the radar. The second Lion class battlecruiser, and the battlecruiser with the least attention. Or, at any rate, the least attention of the ships involved in the Battle of Jutland. This is unfortunate, because Princess Royal actually took quite a pounding at that battle. Then again, I suppose the fact she didn't blow up is why this ship isn't covered as much. Not as flashy, if you'll pardon the pun. With that in mind, let's look at Princess Royal, the oft-ignored battlecruiser of the Royal Navy. Beginning, as always, with the technical bits. As the second of the Lion-class battlecruisers, Princess Royal was the classic example of a second-generation British battlecruiser. Bigger, faster, and better protected. A far superior design compared to the first generation. Much like the contemporary jump to Super Dreadnoughts, the biggest dividing line was in the main battery. First-generation battlecruisers use the 12-inch or 305mm gun. On Lion, and by extension Princess Royal, this was changed to the more potent 13.5-inch or 343mm weapon. Other improvements came in speed and in armor protection. Neither were quite the same jump in capability, but they remain notable in their own right. The combination of these changes, from firepower to protection, created a powerful ship. While German battlecruisers, Grosse Kreuze, were better protected, the British ships were faster and more powerfully armed. Although it is worth noting that some sources will claim the German ships to be at least as fast, if not faster. That's something that varies between sources. In any event, Princess Royal was a marked improvement in British design. I'll briefly go over the exact specifications now. Princess Royal displaced just under 27,000 tons at her standard load, with this rising to 31,310 tons at her full load. When it came to firepower, Princess Royal, as mentioned earlier, swapped 12-inch guns for 13.5-inch weapons. In keeping with general British design practice, she carried the same guns as the contemporary battleship design. However, the Lions carried one less turret. Orion through Iron Duke carried 10 13.5-inch rifles and five twin turrets. Princess Royal, and by extension her sister ships, carried eight of the same gun in four twin turrets, two super firing on the bow, one amidships, and one on the stern. The same general layout as the battleships, but minus the aft super firing turret. These were supported by 16 four inch secondary guns in casement mountings. These were carried in the superstructure around the bridge and the large aft superstructure. Rounding off weaponry, in this case, were the traditional submerged torpedo tubes, two 21-inch tubes, with one mounted on either broadside. An already questionable choice, made even more questionable by only carrying one tube on either side of the ship. When it came to armor protection, then, Princess Royal had a main belt, ranging from 4 to 9 inches in thickness. An improvement on the previous design 6-inch belt, but still a bit thinner than German practice, which only leaves speed to go over. Princess Royal could manage around 28 knots, with her sea trials reaching 28.5. This speed came from 70,000 shaft horsepower through four shafts, a completely respectable speed for the time. Although, don't tell the British press about that speed. Burt cites an article from the Army and Navy Gazette that reads as follows. Speeds for the Princess Royal have reached 34.7 knots, which ensures that the next German battlecruisers will have to reach a speed of 35 knots to counter that of the British ship. I'm sure the Royal Navy would have loved if the Splendid Cats could reach destroyer levels of speed. Breathless newspaper articles aside, 
That finishes the techie bits, so let's move on to her service. Laid down on May 2nd, 1910, and launched on April 29th, 1911, Princess Royal had a fast construction process. The British were pumping out these ships as fast as they possibly could during the naval arms race with Germany. This is further reflected in Princess Royal, commissioning a little over a year after her launch on November 14th, 1912. Before I move on, for those wondering, the name Princess Royal is in reference to Princess Louise. The title of Princess Royal is given to the eldest daughter of the reigning British monarch. Or rather, it can be given to them, but it isn't an automatic thing. In any event, that's where the name HMS Princess Royal originated, both referring to the title and specifically to Princess Louise, who actually did the formal launching of the ship in 1911. With that done, Princess Royal's initial service career was a quiet one. She joined the 1st Cruiser Squadron shortly after commissioning, with that renamed to the 1st Battle Cruiser Squadron at the start of 1913. From that point on, until the start of the Great War, Princess Royal had very little to do. The Battle Cruiser visited friendly ports in both France and Russia. Specifically, she sailed to Brest in February of 1914, and then on to Russia in June. There's a nice picture of Princess Royal alongside the Russian cruiser Admiral Makarov during that visit. Nice pictures aside, however, Princess Royal's career only became exciting with the coming of World War. In common with the other modern battle cruisers, she spent much of her time with the Grand Fleet. This did, at least initially, mean she didn't see a great deal of action. The ship was present for the first Battle of Heligoland Bight on August 28, 1914. This was, largely, an engagement between light forces. The British intended to ambush German destroyers using their own destroyers and light cruisers. Princess Royal was only involved as part of a five-battle cruiser squadron playing heavy support. Her direct contribution, alongside her sister HMS Lion, saw the sinking of two German-like cruisers. A success, although not exactly a major one, in line with the Battle of the Falkland Islands. Which I bring up because Princess Royal is indirectly related to that battle. After escorting a Canadian troop convoy in September, Princess Royal largely spent her time on patrol duty. That is, until November of 1914. At the start of that month, the battlecruiser was detached from the 1st Battlecruiser Squadron. Princess Royal, all on her lonesome, was sent to reinforce British forces in the Caribbean. Admiral Maximilian von Spey's squadron had just ravaged the British at the Battle of Coronel. Princess Royal was, as a result intended to keep an eye out for the German ships, specifically to watch for the unlikely event that they made for the Panama Canal. The fact only Princess Royal was assigned to that area should make it clear how unlikely this really was. In the event, she arrived in Halifax on November 21st, 1914, and then sailed to first New York, then on to the Caribbean. Princess Royal remained in the general area for some time, at least until Von Spey met his end off the Falkland Islands on December 8, 1914. With the German threat neutralized, Princess Royal was no longer needed in the Caribbean. As such, she returned to the Grand Fleet on December 19. Her second moment of real excitement came fairly quickly after that the first proper battlecruiser engagement of the war, the Battle of Dogger Bank on January 24th, 1915. This saw British and German battlecruisers fighting each other directly instead of engaging smaller cruisers. That said, it ultimately ended up being another case of battlecruisers beating up an armored cruiser in the end. While the start of the engagement saw the battlecruisers exchanging fire, This didn't last long. The battlecruiser action began around 8.52 a.m. 
on January 24th. By 9.30, HMS Lion, the British flagship, suffered her first hit. Within a couple hours, around 11 a.m., Lion was so severely damaged that command passed to HMS New Zealand. The confusion of this change in command, due in large part to signaling errors, saw the German battlecruisers make their escape. SMS Blücher, on the other hand, became the sole target of all the intact British battlecruisers. Earlier in the battle, Princess Royal had landed a shell that crippled the German armored cruiser. This was one of relatively few shell hits she landed in the battle, but it was a critical hit. It slowed the already relatively slow armored cruiser down and left her vulnerable. After a short period firing at Derflinger, Princess Royal focused all her fire on Blücher. Her shells, in concert with the other British ships, ultimately sank the armored cruiser. This is not to say that Princess Royal performed exceptionally well in this battle. She hit Derflinger once, which flooded a coal bunker. She also hit Blücher at least twice. That amounts to three confirmed hits, and maybe a couple further hits in the confusion of everyone ganging up on the armored cruiser. Out of 271 main battery shells. That's not an amazing hit ratio by any stretch of the imagination. On the other hand, she apparently fired her main battery at a German airship during the battle. This is an interesting historical note, considering those guns were not at all intended to shoot at a Zeppelin. Regardless, with Dogger Bank done, Princess Royal returned to the Banani of patrol duty. She hadn't taken any damage at the battle, in contrast with her sister Lion, so she didn't even need repairs. As a direct result, Princess Royal spent the rest of 1915 and early 1916 on blockade duty. This duty was so quiet that even Bert makes no note of it, simply jumping straight from Dogger Bank to Jutland. In fairness, this isn't surprising. Jutland would be the next major clash between the British and German fleets. The major battle when you think about it. As for the battle, it began poorly for the Royal Navy. During the run to the south, the battlecruiser forces engaged one another once again. This came around 3.45 in the afternoon on May 31st, 1916. Rivers of ink have been spilled on this action, and Admiral Beatty's role in particular. For the purposes of this video, let's focus on Princess Royal. As one of the two leading ships in the British formation, alongside her sister Lion, Princess Royal was one of the first ships engaged in the battle. Her fire was focused, at first, on the German flagship Lutzo. In turn, Princess Royal was targeted by SMS Derflinger. This ship got her revenge for Dogger Bank, landing three hits early on in the battle. Things would only get worse for Princess Royal, although never to the same extent as the unfortunate Lion. That said, the situation could have gone very badly. A torpedo was sighted beneath Princess Royal around 4.11 p.m. That torpedo came from one of the German battlecruisers, although Princess Royal's crew thought it was a U-boat. It would, had the torpedo hit, also been the incredibly rare instance of a capital ship torpedo actually doing something. As it turned out, the torpedo hit nothing, and smoke from Lion's fires temporarily shielded Princess Royal from further German attack. That was a good thing, for this ship. It was a rather less good thing for HMS Queen Mary, her half-sister. Queen Mary became the focus of Derflinger's fire, which contributed to her sinking around 4.30. HMS Indefatigable had similarly blown up earlier in the battle. Soon after Queen Mary's explosion, Princess Royal came under fire again. The straddle from those shells temporarily obscured the ship which led to a report that she had blown up as well. This prompted the infamous, 
there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today, quote. As it turned out, there was absolutely nothing wrong with Princess Royal. She sailed out of the water spouts, no worse for wear, and remained with the rest of the British formation. Her major role in the battle was, however, largely over. Princess Royal continued to engage the German fleet, but she was ultimately credited with only five hits. Three on Lutso, and two on Seidlitz. In turn, Princess Royal was hit six times during the initial battlecruiser engagement. And then she was hit two more times against the German battleships. Those two shell hits from SMS Markgraf are interesting. One disabled her X turret, and the other penetrated her side armor. Either one of which could have been devastating, but Princess Royal sailed right along without major issue. She would, in the end, survive the battle. With Jutland over, then, Princess Royal went in for repairs to her battle damage. Those repairs lasted until July 15, 1916, at which point Princess Royal rejoined the Grand Fleet and proceeded to never again see combat. Jutland was Princess Royal's last combat action. For the remainder of the war, she never again fired her guns in anger. After the end of the Great War, HMS Princess Royal served with the Atlantic Fleet in 1919. However, as the Great Naval Disarmament began, the Splendid Cats were on the chopping block. HMS Tiger would squeak through, lasting until the 1930s, but that would not be the case with Princess Royal. She was placed in reserve in 1920, before ultimately being scrapped in 1923. As a final historical side note, the British evidently offered Princess Royal to Chile in 1920, presumably as a replacement for Almirante Cochran, the ship that became HMS Eagle. The Chileans refused the offer, however, and Princess Royal went to the scrappers. A sad, but not unexpected, end to her story. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.